All right, let's pray and we'll get started. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We love you in this place. We thank you. We honor you. You are wonderful, magnificent, beautiful, glorious, all powerful, all knowing, ever present God. You are, we, we honor you in this place. So, Father, I, I thank you for your presence that is with us no matter where we are, present with all of us, Lord. Lord, even as we lean in once again into your word, to learn from your word, Holy Spirit, breathe your breath over us, breathe your breath over your word. Let it bring to life every dead thing, every, every forgotten promise, every dead uh, dream. Let it come back to life, I pray. Lord, I pray that you will burden us a hunger and a thirst like never before to worship you, to honor you. Uh, like you alone deserve it, Father. So in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. All right. Um, so in this class, in this today's session, we'll learn uh, about, we'll continue for in chapter 6 uh, on becoming a worshipper. Okay. Becoming a worshipper. So in the previous class, just to do a, a very quick recap, we spoke about... Uh, spiritual worship versus fleshly worship, right? Or, or, and then we concluded by talking about uh, idolatry, idol worship, and the dangers of idol worship, isn't it? So that's what we discussed. Um, it is the Holy Spirit that helps us worship in spirit and in truth. And the opposite of worshiping in truth is false worship. Um, and so we, we looked at uh, many scriptures quite uh, in, in depth, but today we'll look at just one example without uh, turning a lot of pages. Uh, we'll look at one example of extravagant worship, a worship, uh, an example of an extravagant worshiper. Um, so what is an extra, what is the meaning of the word extravagant in your own words? Pasta out of ordinary. Out of ordinary, okay. Out of ordinary, okay. Thank you. What else? Anybody else would like to share? Please feel free to unmute and speak. Extravagant is an action uh, that is uh, expressing yourself uh, without any restraint, like without anything holding you back. Uh, another, uh, another example will be, uh, let's say, uh, he spends, he or she spends extravagantly, meaning if someone goes shopping, uh, you know, they'll start buying everything, anything beyond their budget without control. You, you get it, right? That's extravagant uh, as well. So oh, he's so extravagant in his shopping. Uh, he just buys things without any control. So, you know, uh, and it, it's an action that is expressed without any restraint. Okay, I hope we kind of got that. So thank you, rich, grand, different. Um, yep, okay. So if you, what we're going to look at today is an example of an extravagant worshipper. In other words, that a, a person who expressed worship without any restraints, who did not hold back in expressing. Okay, so that's what we're going to look at. Let us all turn to Luke chapter 7. In your Bibles, uh, turn to Luke chapter 7. Um, we're going to start reading from verse 36. Luke chapter 7, verse 36 onwards. Okay. All 
All right, thank you. So here we go. This is what it says. Look, chapter 7, verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with, with the fragrant oil. Verse 39, Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is, who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Okay, let's pause. Before we continue, we can read that whole chapter and it's just absolutely beautiful. So let's stop. Um, to give a backdrop of this um, chapter, okay, now we are reading from the Gospel of Luke. Okay. Um, and from verse 36 onwards, we don't know who this Pharisee is. You, you know, we can... We can dig deeper and study, but it says in verse 36, then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. Okay, so what's happening is in, in their culture, in the Jewish culture, uh, if a rabbi, uh, you know, a teacher of the law came to a town or a village, uh, and if, if someone is hosting the rabbi, they will have something called the open house. Open house means the the person who is hosting the rabbi or a teacher or a prophet, their house would be open to the entire village. So anybody from the town in that village can come to their home. And so, and this is a very, uh, you know, a great uh, grand event uh, apparently because a rabbi is coming a pharisee has in invited and in this scenario it happens to be jesus who is invited and so the word has spread all across the village saying okay there's this rabbi called jesus coming there's this rabbi called jesus coming and so the word has spread the house is open to all the neighbors everyone uh you know so everybody is living there there are a lot of people in the living room and whatnot, right? And so Jesus comes and he sits at the table. Now, again, once again, in their culture, they they don't sit like how you and I are sitting, like you know, on a chair, on a table. Uh, nice. No, I'm not sure if you've been to uh, an um, Arabian Arabic restaurant. Uh, from we have quite a few Arabic restaurant, uh, authentic ones in Bangalore. Uh, some of them have these, uh, you know, where you sit on the floor and you recline like this, you know. So you actually sit on the floor on a bed and, you know, the food plate will be kept down uh, on a mat. And so you recline, your legs will be, you know, you hope you get what I'm saying, right? So that's how you recline. And, uh, and one person... You know, so if if I'm here, another person in a very similar posture would be behind me here. And so if I have to talk to that person, I just have to turn my face and the person will be behind me and you can speak. So that was the setting in how uh, they would dine. You know, the, the guests would rest. Uh, you know, it was a very relaxed atmosphere. It was a very relaxed posture as well. Okay, they're just going to sit and chill. And have some bread and cheese, okay. <laughs> so uh, probably some wine. Uh, so that's what's happening. And then here we see the story in verse thirty-seven unfolding. And behold, 
a woman in the city who was a sinner. Okay, uh, let's stop again there. Now, the translation by now has become very diplomatic. Diplomatic means it's being very nice. So she's an, uh, a, a woman who is a sinful woman who is a sinner. Uh, but a more stronger translation will say an adulterous woman. But in all rawness, okay, uh, let's take off the veil of uh, hiding behind this thing of say, oh, Christian. But what it's actually saying is that she was an adulterous woman, which in other words means prostitute. Whew. Bible college class, how can I mention those words? What are you teaching us, pastor? Well, it's what it is. You have a problem with that, you have to learn to deal with it. Bible doesn't hide anything. Bible has never hidden anything from the beginning. Uh, it states what it is. So, an adulterous woman, a woman who did who was who did not have a very good reputation in the village. Everyone in that village knew who she was and what she did for a living. Everyone in that village, in that town knew who this woman was and what she did for a living. Now, can you imagine the heart rate of this woman? Let's put ourselves in her shoes, okay? Uh, just ima can you can you imagine with me? Is that okay? Yeah, will you imagine with me? We'll just go on this uh, small little journey if we can. Right, imagine comes from the word image, uh, magi, magi, magic. All of that comes from the word imagine. Imagination is one of the most powerful tools God has given to us. Uh, you know, magi from the east came. <laughs> we see that in Matthew, right? So imagination, image, uh, magic. So let's go on this journey of imagination. Um, okay, let's put ourselves in her shoes. Thumbs up. Okay. So I've heard, we've heard that Jesus is coming to town, and he is there in this in this person's house and this person is not an ordinary person this person is a Pharisee he's a scribe he works in the temple he's a priest the Pharisees and the Sadducees they are not ordinary people they have uh, had a certain esteem in the society so Jesus in the in the house is in the house of a Pharisee but I want to go meet him I know I am a sinner. I know I am. I have lived a sinful life. I am unholy. I am unclean. I am not worthy. But I am broken on the inside. I want healing. I want to meet that man. Her heart is racing. Right, it's beating really fast. What do I do? What do I do? Should I go? Should I not? Should I go? Should I not? Should I go? Should I not? And finally, she makes up her mind. She takes an alabaster jar with her. And she starts walking. Probably sweating. You know, she's her heart is filled with anxiety. She's stressed. She might be stressed. She's got her head down. That's like the walk of shame, isn't it? Um, because she knows everybody. Everybody in the town knows who she is, what she's done, what she does for a living. But she, there she is. She's taking the jar of oil and she's walking. And then she comes to the house. She stands at the entrance of the door. And as she's standing at the entrance of the door, she steps into the house 
you can you, you can imagine that okay everybody was having a nice laugh talking loudly the hall must have been loud with everybody chit chatting you know and soon as she stepped in the whole room goes quiet Shh. and after some time they start murmuring what is she doing here? What is she doing here? What is she doing? How can she be here? How can she be here? What 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 is what is she doing here? What's she doing here? And she can hear all these murmuring. She can she hears, okay, and she knows that everybody there is talking about her. All of them could recognize her because they knew who she was, what she did. And probably if she lifted up her head and saw the room, she could also re recognize a few men. Maybe they've been with her. Maybe they would have been with her. You get what I'm saying? Right? I mean, all of these details are not in the Bible, guys. You know, because, but imagine, okay, it's, it's not some walk in the park kind of situation that is happening here. Um, but she can hear all these voices. Don't you know who you are? Don't you know what you did? Don't you know where you come from? Uh, how dare you be here? Don't you know your worth? You are worthless. You have no worth. You should, you should be ashamed of yourself. All these voices that we hear sometimes, right? she heard. But all she could do was have a laser focus. All mattered for her was Jesus. She could only see Jesus in the room. It did not care. She didn't care who was in the room. She didn't care how many men were in the room. All she could see was Jesus. She goes straight to him. Then it says in verse 37, she stood, she knew that Jesus sat at the table, brought an alabaster jar of fragrant oil, verse 38, and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. So there, there's this version of the story mentioned in all the Gospels. Uh, if for your reference, you can make, you can read it. John 12, verse 1 to 7. That's one reference. John chapter 12, verse 1 to 7. Mark chapter 14, verse 3 to 9. Mark chapter 14, verse 3 to 9. And Matthew chapter 26, verse 7 onwards. Matthew chapter 26, verse 7 onwards. Okay. Uh, once again, John chapter 12, verse 1 to 7. Mark 14, verse 3 to 9. And finally, Matthew chapter 26, verse 7. We'll all have different accounts of the similar story. Uh, Gospels are beautiful. You know, we, we, we only think, uh, we, we only say, you know, say the names Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, like it's just some random names. But we forget that they were human beings like you and me. They were actual person, right? Like, four different individuals had their own way of saying a story, saying a narrative. And Luke was very different. Uh, he would give information of a woman when it is necessary to honor her and hide the in, uh, information of a woman which was unnecessary. In this case, you see, he's hiding the identity of a woman to protect her. 
but at the same time to honor uh, you know when you read through the genealogy of uh, Jesus in the gospel of Luke he brings it from the line of Mary to honor her and the same way Luke the gospel of Luke honors women very differently and it's the same thing with all the other gospels as well. They they have their own way of expressing narrative. You know, it's it's beautiful. Uh, but okay, let's just come back to this. Uh, so when you read the other accounts, right, of the similar story, uh, say for Matthew or Mark, it says she brought the alabaster jar and she broke it. She broke the alabaster jar. Now, what's the significant part about it? Uh, you know. Oh, I don't have a bottle here. Okay, so <laughs> okay, don't laugh. Okay, I'm going to use uh, my son's toys on the table. I did not know it, how it landed up here, but it's here. Don't laugh. Okay, <laughs> so let's imagine this is uh, a bottle. Okay, so. No, I'm just kidding. Now, if I'm just pouring, I, I still have control over how much I want to pour, right? I can pour, you know, little by little, uh, you know, not everything. But if I break it, I have no control over how much I want to give. Are you with me? And so, when the gospel says that she broke the alabaster jar, she was saying that she wants, saying that you are worthy of it all. I don't want to contain it. Another significant part about that oil, that fragrant oil, is the prostitutes in that culture in those days would use that fragrance to seduce men, to allure men into them. Okay, and one more interesting fact about this, uh, the perfume those days, it was very expensive. Uh, the gospel says, the account says, it was worth one year's wages, one year's salary. Okay, we'll get to that in just a minute. Another fact, interesting fact about that perfume was it was exported. That means it was imported by Israel. And it was exported from Nepal and India. So, at the foothills of Himalayas, there are these pink flowers, right? And so those flowers would be crushed to extract this fragrant oil and put in a jar and then export it. And so that's why it was expensive. And, uh, and then, you know, it was also used to allure men into, uh, you know, by, by prostitutes. So what she was doing is that she was going to him and saying, I'm breaking this at your feet because I don't want to have any control over my, oops, I don't want to have any control over my old life. I'm surrendering it all. I'm giving you my past. I'm giving you my everything. And so she leaves it all at his feet. So she breaks it at his feet. She wipes his feet with her hair, and she begins to go away. Another interesting point that's mentioned in this account is that it's, it talks about her tears. Why is her tears mentioned? Why does it say that you know she stood at his feet weeping? You know, there's a psalm that says he collects a bottle, uh, our tears in a bottle. You know that, right? The Bible says he collects our tears in a bottle. What's so special about our tears? Why would it have to be mentioned here that she stood at his feet weeping? She wiped his feet with her tears. You see, the beauty of tears is... It, you know, in the book of Revelation, it says there will there is coming a day where there will be no shame, no pain, no tears when we are with our Lord in heaven. No shame, no pain, no tears. So when we worship Jesus, 
when we choose to worship Jesus in our pain and with our tears, we are giving something to Jesus here on earth, what we cannot give him in heaven. Understood. When we worship, when we make the choice to worship Jesus in our pain and in our tears, we are giving him something that we cannot give him in heaven. And that becomes very special, more special than the worship of the angels. God is surrounded by the best worship ever in the heavens, by the seraphim and the cherubim. But then he still lean in, leans in to our worship, our brokenness in worship. Okay, let's move on. Verse 39, but now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself. That means he said to himself, if only this man knew if, if he were a prophet, he would know who this woman is, what kind of a woman she is. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Uh oh, when Jesus says that he has something to say to you, you <laughs> better pay attention, right? So Simon says, teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and other 50. And when they had nothing with each to, to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Verse 43. Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this. Look at those wo words, okay? Listen, read very carefully. It says, <laughs> he, verse 43, sorry, verse 44, he turned to the woman and said to Simon. So he's looking at the woman, but he's talking to Simon. Oh, it's... Imagine, guys, it must have just been a quite a scene. Have you ever done that? You're looking at one person, but you're talking to someone else? You're, you know, sending a message kind of a thing? <laughs> yeah. So he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Okay, it's, uh, are you guys okay? Are you doing all right? Alive, right? Okay. Okay, so again, what's happening? So he, Jesus narrates a story, uh, an example, uh, like a parable, like he always did, um, like they always did in that culture. Uh, he gives an example of two people who owed money to a person, uh, and then uh, he asks who would who would be more, who would love more, and then Jesus, and I mean, sorry, the Simon the Pharisee says, the one who was forgiven much. That means the one who had to repay more would love much because he was forgiven freely. And Jesus looks at the woman and he's talking to Simon by saying, I came to your house. 
again, once again, in, it's uh, very important to know that in their culture, any guest who came home, the first thing you would do is you would give them water to wash their hands and their feet. Unlike today, they wouldn't have Reebok or Nike shoes, fancy shoes to wear and come. They wore sandals, simple people. And they, you know, it's, the roads were pretty dusty. They would have walked quite a long distance. And so their hands would be dirty, their feet would be dirty. So first thing that the host of the house would give the guest is water to wash their hands and their feet. They, and then they would welcome them with a kiss. After they welcomed them with a kiss, they would anoint their hand with this fragrant, you know, one of the fragrant oils, just a drop of it. It was their culture. And Jesus is saying all of this, you invited me. You know about our culture, and yet you did not do anything about it. You didn't give me water to wash my hands or my feet. You didn't greet me with a kiss. You didn't anoint me. But yet, this woman does. And so he look, Jesus looked at her and says, her many sins are forgiven. Verse 47, in Luke chapter 7, verse 47 says, Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. So again, he's, he's saying, he's, he's telling this to Simon. He's saying, therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. For she loved much. And then he said to her, in verse 48, your sins are forgiven. <sighs> okay. Now, you tell me, we've, I think we've read uh, at least 12 verses from Luke chapter 7, verse 36 to 47, or 48. About 12 verses, right? I think so. Okay. Yeah. Okay, question for us. Has this woman spoken a single word? Has this woman said a single word? She didn't. She didn't come praise like, Lord, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. Lord, help me, help me, help me, help me. Lord, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. She doesn't say a single word. She doesn't pray. She doesn't even ask for forgiveness. She didn't even come asking for forgiveness. All she did was she came. It didn't matter who was in the room. All that mattered to her was Jesus. That I am going to love him like no other person. I'm going to give my all. I'm going to surrender my all. And this act of worship was very scary to people around because they did they they didn't think that it was worship and so they so here's the thing what happens when you see an expression of worship you've never seen before is you will begin to judge it i'll say that again when you begin when you see an expression of worship which you've never seen before you will be scared and you will begin to judge how is this possible can you really do that that's exactly what was happening at this time in this bible is that nobody has ever seen had ever seen an act of worship like that before and so they were all taken aback what is happening here i don't understand this so she doesn't even make a prayer she doesn't even cry for forgiveness all she does is she comes and she pours her love on Jesus she anoints her his head his feet with the oil with the tears she wipes his feet with her hair again in their culture it was not right for women to let their hair down undignified she lets her hair down and she wipes his feet with her hair and then Again, just begin to imagine with me. 
she does she was there she did what she came to do and now she's slowly walking back she's slowly walking back she's collecting the pieces of the jars maybe she's walking back with her again her head down with full tears in her eyes and I'd like to imagine or think that suddenly someone in the room must have asked this question hey is that fragrance, that beautiful smell, is that fragrance coming from the feet of Jesus or is it coming from her hair? Is that fragrance coming from the feet of Jesus or is it coming from her hair? I'm just thinking, you know, someone must, someone in the room must have asked that question. You know, maybe not. But they must have thought about it. I surely would have. But, but the point is this. She came in a different person. She went back smelling like the way Jesus would smell. That means the whole room, everybody in the room knew that she was in a very close space with Jesus. That she had worshipped him very intimately. And that's the point here, uh, everyone, is that when you have worshipped Jesus so intimately, every person around you will know that you have been with Jesus because you will be carrying the fragrance of Jesus. Paul writes in Corinthians that Jesus is the fragrant one. <laughs> he writes, yeah, in the Corinthians, that he is the fragrant one. And that means when you have spent that intimate time of worship with Jesus, who you are, what you've done, your past, your sins are all wiped away. And you begin to smell like him. You carry, you begin to carry the fragrance of the fragrant one. And that is the beauty of being an extravagant worshiper is that we don't go to worship Jesus so I can get a breakthrough, I can get some more money, I can get a healing. All of that is great. All of We need all of that. But an extravagant worshiper will go to Jesus simply because he is worthy. If this woman had a million alabaster jars, I'm sure she would still break all of it because Jesus is worth it. Are you with me? Right. The Bible says that it, that oil was one year's wages, isn't it? Yes, one year's salary. Yeah. How did she earn that salary? Hmm. Think. So I would want to just. I think I'll pause here. Um, I just want to encourage us all. I I. Uh, there's so many things that we can take away from her life. Jesus, in another gospel, and I think in Matthew, he says, what she has done will be remembered, will be spoken of in memory of her. What she has done will be spoken or remembered in memory of her. That means when Jesus is saying that, Jesus is saying, he wanted her to be remembered. I mean, hold on. Jesus, you know, all your disciples, your apostles are going to die for you. And they all died for Jesus. You know, from, from James to Peter, John, all of them died for Jesus. Are you saying that beyond all of them, what they did for you, what they're going to do for you, that she will be remembered? you got to think about it, isn't it? And an act of an extravagant worshipper will be remembered forever. An act of an extravagant worshipper will resonate in the heavens forever. It will be spoken of forever. And so I want to encourage each and every one of us, uh, you know, who's listening. Um, 
I want to urge you to be an extravagant worshiper. There is a beauty in just letting it all go and say, Lord, I give you control. I come just as I am. I don't understand a lot of things that I'm going through, but yet you are still worthy. I'm going to give you my all. I'm going to surrender my all because I know that you are bigger than the biggest step of faith I will ever take. Right? And so uh, with that, I'll conclude today's lesson. And I hope there was something that you could take away and that encourages you to be an extravagant worshiper. Uh, meditate on these scriptures when you can. Ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you, reveal to you, teach you to be this extravagant worshiper. All right? Fantastic. Well, thank you all for joining in. God bless you. I'll see you all next week. See you.